right, welcome to the Making Sense Project webinar, October 22nd. My name is Hillary Hunt, and it's a pleasure to be here with you today to um, talk about a variety of topics related to personal finance and economic education here in the state of Pennsylvania, and to share with you a variety of programs um, that might assist you in teaching personal finance and economics to your students. Um, here you can see the agenda. If you haven't had a chance yet, uh, this is also available online on our makingsensepa.org website under the webinars section. You're welcome to download it along with the bios of our presenters today. The Making Sense webinars are offered in partnership between the Pennsylvania Department of Education and Penn State University and are part of a series of financial literacy and economic education initiatives. We'll talk about a little bit more of some of the things that we're doing in that series um, as well a little bit later in the program. The goals of our program are threefold. We try and provide curriculum resources, content knowledge, and professional information. You'll get some of all of that uh, here today on the webinar. Our project partners that I'd like to thank and, and make note of are both Sally Flaherty with the Pennsylvania Department of Education and Dr. Kathy Bowen, professor at Penn State University. Um, without the, the these two folks, we would not be able to pull off the, this uh, program at all. So I thank both Sally and Kathy for their participation and, and their leadership and guidance on this project. And now let's move forward into the agenda of the pro professional information as well as our new personal finance model curriculum and money management in Generation Z. I'm covering a lot today um, here at the beginning of our, uh, of our agenda. So first, under the professional information, um, those of you who have joined us before know that one of the things that we try and do is keep track of what's taking place in financial literacy across the state and economic education. And I thought that it might be of interest for those of you that aren't aware um, to know that the House Education Committee here in Pennsylvania recently held uh, a public hearing on financial literacy just on the, the 6th of October. They had several panels and panelists that presented um, and included in those are our very own uh, Kathy Bowen that I mentioned earlier, who's, who's on the webinar with us today from, from Penn State University, uh, Mary Rosencrantz, who chaired the task force on uh, financial literacy and economic education, with Mike Wishnow from the Credit Union Association, uh, two superintendents, as well as a uh, representative Rosemary Brown. Um, the representative that you see there in the photo is uh, Representative Mark Longjetty. He serves on the House Education Committee and also provided remarks at the hearing. Um, if this is something that is of interest to you, I'd encourage you to go out and look at the recording. It is um, available right now on the House Republicans um, website. You can see the link that is provided there. Just as a reminder, I will upload uh, the PDF version of these PowerPoint slides um, after the conclusion of our webinars today. So um, don't feel like you have to keep taking copious notes uh, just enough to, to make sure that you get anything that's not here on the slides themselves. There is um, legislation in play um, in Harrisburg regarding financial literacy and, and economic education. Uh, the one right now that is probably of most interest to the, the broad uh, uh, audience is House Bill 1839. This is a bill that would require all students in Pennsylvania to take a course in personal finance before graduation. And this is something that was very much discussed as part of the um, hearings that were held. There are um, a couple of options in this legislation. Um, this hones in on the 11th or 12th grade provides for several options for delivery. Um, we are anticipating that there will be some additional bills um, introduced either still in this session, possibly both in the House and the sentence, uh, Senate, as well as um, in the beginning of the new um, new session here that will begin in January. So um, if this is something that's interest to you, if you're, you're keen on advocating for these types of things, I'd encourage you to, to take a look at those um, and follow along as, uh, as those are, are coming, coming out. The next item that I want to talk about and share with you are the um, uh, new uh, study that was done, a new international study that was done, um, and it's referred to as the PISA study. Um, that's uh, 
there you'll see on the, the graphic, the Program for International Student Assessment um, is what PISA stands for. But uh, in their 2012 assessment that they did, and this is done by the Organization for, um, uh, for Economic Cooperation and Development, OECD, they included for the first time ever um, a, a series of, uh, of items on financial literacy. And so in addition to, to testing students on where they stood with math and um, reading and uh, reading language arts and, uh, and science, they were also taking a look um, very closely at, uh, at personal finance. And so that is um, something that I think many folks might uh, be interested in. We were um, not at the top of the, uh, the heap, so to speak. Um, we were kind of in the middle um, in terms of the countries that participated in PISA. Um, there is definitely some lessons that can be learned, I believe, from the other countries that participated. Um, there is a full um, a full, a full uh, report on this study, as well as sample items um, that are available. I wanted to just share a little bit more about it, just because um, I think that there's um, some interesting applications as well for you and for your students potentially in your classroom. So the the application I think for for the classroom to take away from this. Um, is in how they structured and how they developed their assessment. Um, and I just found this very fascinating when I went to the, to the announcement in Washington, D.C. of the results. Um, this is one of, one of my key takeaways in, in addition to just the results and sort of where we stood in the U.S. So I thought um, I would share this in particular. And that is that they looked at sort of three domains, if you will, um, when they were developing there, these assessment items. And so for each and every item, um, they categorize them by the content, the process, and the context in which um, that, that question would, would lie. And so here in content, they divided the content into money and transactions, planning and managing finances, risk and reward, and the financial landscape. And then they have four different processes, identifying financial information, et cetera, and then four contexts. So was this question asked in the context of um, education and work, the home and family, the individual, or more of a societal question? And I thought it was fascinating. They gave an example of sort of a, of a cube and the best graphic I could find of a four by four by four cube um, was the Rubik's cube here. Um, and so basically, if you will, if you can think of it along these lines, um, in their assessments, they have ones that, that are at each and every point um, on the exterior and interior of the cube to match up with all of those different um, content, processes, and context. And I just thought it was a really fascinating way to look at, at how we're assessing um, uh, personal finance, um, whether or not those are questions that have home and family um, context, or individual context, societal context. And I just think it's really fascinating and something that um, might be of interest to, to some of our participants. So here's one of their sample questions. Now, this is considered a level one um, question. So this is at the very most basic level um, of understanding. And here they, uh, they said, Sarah receives this invoice in the mail. And so the student looks at the, the invoice. And I would just note that throughout these tests, um, they use the, the Zs instead of dollars or euros or something else that would be identifying by um, by a country, they use this, um, these sort of ubiquitous Zs, um, and, uh, uh, and the, the country is Zedland. So um, these are to try and be, uh, um, make a level playing field um, in, the, in the international assessment world. And so the question for the, that followed this is, why was this invoice sent to Sarah? Because she needs the money to pay Brazy clothing, because Brazy clothing needs to pay the money to Sarah because Sarah has to um, pay the money to Breezy Clothing or because Breezy, Breezy Clothing has paid the money to Sarah. So obviously the, the correct answer here would be A. Um, and you see then that this is, you know, again, a, a level one question that's being asked in, um, 
in the content of money and transactions. The process that's being used here is identifying financial information in the context that's identified here is the individual. And so if this is something that's of interest to you, I'd encourage you to go and, and look at what they've done with the, the PISA framework. There's additional information that's available um, on their website and, and might be of, of interest to you um, to take a look at. Next, I'd just like to remind folks that you can um, connect with us in lots of different ways with what we're doing with the Making Sense Project. Um, we have a Facebook page, a Pinterest um, account with lots of Pinterest, uh, with lots of boards there on Pinterest, and also a, uh, a Twitter page. Um, one of the most useful parts of our Twitter page, not, we don't tweet very much, but you might find um, by who we follow a lot of other organizations or entities that you might want to follow as well. Also, I'm hoping that everyone on our webinar today is getting our Making Sense eBlasts. Um, these are um, electronic newsletters that go out um, periodically and um, can include lots of information on um, topics that, that we think would be of, of interest to our, um, our teachers on our list. So um, if you're not currently uh, getting those, please let me know and we'd love to get you added to our list. All right, so next on our agenda, I want to talk a little bit um, about the uh, work that we've been doing to develop a new personal finance model curriculum, as well as a high school course. Some of you were th that were on with us in the spring might have seen a few of these slides that I'm going to talk about in terms of the model pre-K to 12 curriculum, but the other parts I believe will be new to most everybody unless you are part of our team that was um, involved in developing these. These are all um, coming out on, on SAS um, here in the next couple of months, and I'll show you more um, in a few minutes about where you'll be able to access these. Basically, what we did is we took um, all of the concepts that are out there in, in personal finance and tried to decide how we were going to organize them using um, the Wiggins and McTighe Understanding by Design um, uh, sort of uh, framework that is being used quite widely across Pennsylvania. And with that, we identified six big ideas. So our first big idea is the, the um, topic today, money management. Uh, the others are earning, borrowing money, financial services, risk management and insurance, and saving and investing. And as it just so happens to work out, since we have six webinars throughout the school year and six big ideas, we're tying one of those to each of the um, webinars throughout the year, and that's uh, where we came up with the sort of the theme for each of our webinars going forward the rest of the school year. This is what um, a portion of our uh, model pre-K to 12 uh, curriculum looks like. We have uh, identified three long-term transfer goals. These are sort of the ultimate long-end, uh, long-range goals of financial education in, in pre-kindergarten through 12th grade. Um, we've further fleshed out the big ideas. So you see there, it's not just money management, but money management includes setting goals and developing a plan for how to spend, save, and share financial resources. And then associated with each big idea, we have essential questions. So here we have how do financial goals vary across a person's lifetime? In what ways does money management impact reaching financial goals? What constitutes sound financial decision making? How does organized record keeping impact finances? And what factors impact a person's spending plan? I know many of you are required to write lessons um, that utilize essential questions, either for your lesson and or for um, a unit of study. And hopefully some of the things that we're developing here, um, even if you already have a program, will be useful. Um, and if you're talking to folks that don't have programs or your school is still looking at how they can implement uh, financial education across the grade levels, um, hopefully the, this format and some of these tools will be, be very useful to, to you and to them. Then within each of these big ideas, um, we break things down even further. And so here you see that we have the personal finance concepts, the grade levels, and the competencies identified, um, as well as which standards um, that are here in Pennsylvania in the Econ, the Family Consumer Science, Career Education Work, and Business Computer Information Technology standards align with these. So. Um, basically trying to take a lot of the work out of um, this so that folks don't have to reinvent the wheel every time they, they are, are working on these. 
Right now, you can find these online on our makingsensepa.org website under the curriculum um, resources. Um, you'll, you'll see that there um, where you can take a look at it. Um, and these will be coming out on SAS um, here um, later this fall. Right now, if you were to go and log on to SAS, you would find um, under the Curriculum Framework tab, the Library Model Curriculum. And right next door to that, um, when, when this is live, is where the Personal Finance Curriculum um, will be. So that's where you want to go back and, and look for it uh, down the road when it becomes live. We'll also be sending out an alert um, through an eblast when this becomes available on SAS as well. So at the same time, we have also been working on um, trying to develop some, some tools that are a little bit more um, honed and a little bit for, uh, sort of drilled down um, with some real classroom specific and, and um, teacher friendly uh, resources as well. And so those are coming out um, in a different section of SAS. I'll show you where those will live in a few minutes and give you a preview of just one of these tools um, now. So I'm gonna, what I'm going to focus on right now is the model high school personal finance course that we have developed. Um, in a later webinar, um, later down in the year, I will um, also be talking about what we have developed for pre-K to to eight um, that takes a more integrated approach and in how you can very specifically integrate um, these, uh, these concepts and competencies and what have you into um, instruction in, in the lower grades as well. So here we see the same big ideas, but um, in, the, uh, in the high school realm, we've developed these as individual standalone modules. And so the first module that um, is part of the uh, personal finance course that we are recommending here, and this is all based on an 18-week course, is that of money management. So for each of these, you'll find that we've identified um, the title of the, of the module. So in this case, it's money management, what the big idea um, is, the essential questions. We've provided an overview, objectives, focus and important standards, misconceptions and proper conceptions. And then here also concepts, competencies, vocabulary, the assessments, elements of instruction, differentiation, um, and more. And I'm going to go through each of these um, quickly here just to show you um, some of these tools that, that we've developed. So this is drawing from the money management module. So here you see an example of the overview. In this module, students will learn about goal setting, budgeting, consumer decision making, and financial record keeping in order to be successful financial managers. Students will set SMART goals, create a budget, make purchasing decisions, and other money management activities. So you kind of get an idea that here in our first module, we're focusing in on um, a lot of goal setting, decision making, um, and also budgeting. Um, we also spend some time here on um, consumer decision making as well. And so within each of these uh, modules, we have a series of objectives that are identified. And this is an example of the first objective here that shows how not only have we identified the objective, but we also have shown you exactly which standards um, that connects with. So here we're saying at the end of this module, students will be able to analyze the management of financial resources across the lifespan based on a person's values and standard of living. And then here is where that connects with the, uh, the economics, family consumer science, business career, um, or business com computer information technology and career education and work standards as applicable. Now I took out those other standards here and the other ones just so you could see those without having that long list. Um, just to get an idea of what some of these other objectives are. Um, you see, again, the, the reference to SMART goals and goal setting, consumer strategies, needs and wants, understanding of, um, or demonstrating an understanding of statements of net worth, income and expense statements and spending plans, calculating fixed and variable expenses, and proper allocations of any cash surplus to create an effective savings and spending plan when giving and given a net income. So here we're really drilling down into what it is that they're going to do um, and the objectives of 
of this module. Now, um, I would note that um, at a variety of places here, we have also paid attention to making sure that we are um, using um, various uh, depths of knowledge. Um, we, we drew upon the, the, the web's depth of knowledge, DOK, um, chart as well to make sure that we were covering a variety of, of different areas. And so then um, following the objectives, um, when you log on and see these, um, once they're live, you will see the focus standards. So um, you know, previously we, we showed you just the numbers, but right beneath them, you will be able to see the actual standard um, and, and not have to go back and look for those elsewhere. Um, we do differentiate between what we call focus standards and important standards. And this is a differentiation that's been made in the, the ELA and the math. Um, frameworks that have also been developed and are currently live. Um, focus standards being those standards that we're focusing in on the most and are expecting to be taught to mastery in this in this uh, module. And then the important standards are those that have very close alignment, but maybe aren't necessarily being taught completely to mastery. And so um, in addition to the standards that I've referenced earlier, we are also um, drawing in the, the, the standards here, um, with the first number of 16, are coming from our student interpersonal skills standards. So um, that's where, where those standards are coming from. If you're not familiar with those, um, that's another set of standards available on SAS that I'd encourage you to take a look at. So in addition to all of that, and I think this is sort of an interesting and unique um, piece uh, that we've developed with these are misconceptions and proper conceptions uh, tied to this module. And so um, when you see them um, in the framework, when it's when it's unveiled, um, you'll actually see that these are side by side. So misconception number one here would be students tend to believe in financial stereotypes, such as millionaires are extravagant spenders and everyone who lives in a large home has lots of money. And then there's further misconceptions within that. The proper conception to um, to, to offset that first misconception would be that earnings do not necessarily define spending habits. Um, so, you know, just because somebody's a millionaire doesn't mean they spend lots of money um, and uh, so forth and so on throughout the, the misconceptions and proper conceptions of each. I think these are valuable in sort of to helping us to frame um, where our students are and, and where they need to be by the end of it. We've also uh, identified the major concepts within each module, the competencies, and again here um, drawing on various levels um, of depth of knowledge. And then what's the vocabulary in this module? Um, and so you'll see the, the vocabulary identified as well. And then this is where I think sort of the real rubber hits the road. So a lot of that, you, know, you might say, hey, that, that all looks good kind of a, another version of what we've seen elsewhere. But what we've done then is we've also taken all of that and tied it directly to specific assessments and as well as um, instructional strategies from a variety of sources that you can access for free. Those of you who have participated in our webinars or programs in the past know that we try and encourage the use of some very good material that's been developed and is available at no charge to school districts. Um, you know, we know that many school districts don't have the budget to purchase new materials or supplies. And so everything that we're trying to, to connect you with in this um, is something that's available uh, free of charge for, for teachers. So. Um, our assessments, for the most part, draw from NEFI's High School Financial Planning Program, um, the Take Charge Today program, formerly known as FIFI, um, as well as Visa's Practical Money Skills for Life. There are others that we've drawn upon, but these are the three primary sources for the assessment items. And here's an example. So you see, again, the objective that was delineated earlier, the, um, the standards that are being assessed, and then the specific assessment that we're suggesting um, can be used to assess that objective and those standards. So very specific. There's no, you know, no, no take. We tried to take as much of the guesswork as we possibly could um, out of this. And in some cases, we um, are um, we have multiple assessments. Um, in some cases, like this, there's there's one that we've tied um, tied into it. Um, but those vary from from objective to objective. The same thing goes with the elements of instruction and the suggested um, strategies. And here we've drawn from some additional resources, in particular the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia's Keys to Financial Success program. 
And so here's an example of what this might look like in the elements of instruction. So again, we have the, um, the, the first objective listed. Uh, there's just the first of the standards. There's plenty more that come after that. And then some, some, some suggestions. Create a pie chart dividing the lifespan into percentages of a whole, the young adult, middle adulthood, adulthood senior years, and discuss the management of financial resources at each stage. Use a Venn diagram to demonstrate the five domains that make up an individual's well-being, physical, emotional, intellectual, social, and financial. Provide examples to describe each domain. Again, this is all tied to this first objective. We have three more suggested or two more suggested um, strategies. Demonstrate cost comparisons of standards of living in various areas of the United States and guide students through the process of identifying and ranking what they value. And then um, we've tried to identify some of the best lesson plans that we think would tie to this. And so here for this objective, we are um, recommending Nefi's uh, high school financial planning program lesson 3-4 on lifestyle two lessons here from Take Charge Today, as well as a lesson from um, Visa's Practical Money Skills for Life. The ones from Nefi and from Take Charge Today both require you to get a login, um, and they, they live behind, um, behind a password-protected area. Following all those, and again, this this um, is just you know one example of, of a suggested strategy um, and some lesson plans that connect. Um, we also then, uh, for the each module, have interdisciplinary connections, connecting it to math and English language arts, um, as well as technology and other connections. And then we have additional resources. And here we're um, we've shown you where, for example, the Ever Five Foolproof Money Skill Bonsai Consumer Jungle, other other programs out there for financial education, as well as resources from places like um, CFPB, the Consumer Finance Protection Bureau, or television shows um, and other things might might be useful in um, in adding to, to this module. Um, I've often said there's no one size fits all for personal finance. You know, you know your students best. We have not tried to prescribe a you know, do this lesson for this many days and this lesson for this many days and then this lesson for this many days and there, voila, you've taught money management. What we've said is, you know, here's a bunch of great resources. Pick what's going to work best for you and your students, but we've tried to organize them um, in such a form and fashion that it makes it easy to locate. Um, I will tell you that, you know, it, it is, there, there's a lot out there. Um, I have printed every single one of these lessons and now have them organized with a binder um, for, for each of the modules. And I can tell you the money management module and these lessons fill a full one and a half inch binder. Um, there's a lot of different a lot of different stuff out there. You wouldn't necessarily use every single one of those lessons. You'd go through those and pick and choose what it is that you think would be best. But um, we've tried to, to connect you with them here in an easy, in an easy place, um, you know, sort of one-stop shopping, uh, if you will. Uh, these lessons um, would not have been made possible, or the, this, this uh, model course would not have been um, possible without the hard work and dedication of a great team of people. Um, and so here I've listed the, the members of our development team. Um, you can see we've drawn on um, a variety of different resources, um, many teachers from across the state representing a variety of disciplines. We had um, uh, business education teachers, we had family consumer science teachers, and we had a math teacher um, all involved in the development of, uh, of this uh, program. And we think it'll be um, useful for, for all of those disciplines. And it was great to get a, a very interdisciplinary team together to work on this. Finally, um, for when this goes live, um, and I would, I would sort of put a caveat on it because kind of sort of is, but it just doesn't have our content yet. Um, if you go into SAS and you log in um, and go up to the teacher tools section in the very top corner and then <clears throat> into um, the curriculum maps, you will see the PA standards instructional frameworks for personal finance listed there side by side with math and ELA. The only thing is right now, the verbiage that's there is the same as what it is for, for math or ELA. Um, we're waiting for this to be, um, for the, the new content to be um, put there and then for each of the modules to be populated. So when it is live, again, I'll, I'll be sharing um, that with you. If you're in the process right now and you say, hey, Hillary, why are you showing this to me if it's not available yet? Um, in, I, as I mentioned before, the, the first part of what I showed you is available on the Making Sense website. Um, if what you're looking for is this piece, um, which we are um, 
you know, are keeping behind the teacher tools section so that basically kids don't have the the access to the um, you know the keys to the kingdom. They they can't get to the assessments. They can't get to the the lesson plans and all that sort of stuff ahead of you. Um, you know, feel free to, to send me an email and I'm happy to send you um, a PDF of the draft form um, if it's something that you need um, before December when we anticipate these being out. By the way, uh, the uh, SAS Institute is coming up here in December, December 7th through 9th. Um, registration is open for that right now. Um, there's a link on the pdestas.org website for to register for that. I will be presenting along with some, some teachers um, will be joining me to talk about um, the, uh, the model curriculum and, and what's available for schools um, right now. And there's a, a whole lot of other great sessions um, that are going to be held those days as well. So I'd encourage you to think about coming out and joining us in Hershey. Um, everything should be live and online um, in time for that. And uh, we'd love, love to see you there. And so um, I will start looking for any questions that you might have um, on that over in the side. Um, I didn't see any that, that came in right away on, uh, on that one. Um, but if there's any, anything that, that you have, um, I'll be taking a look at those uh, later on. And then I'm going to take a deep breath and move on to our next topic, um, which is money management and Generation Z. So as I said, each of the webinars were focusing in and trying to provide a little bit of content information tied to the topic um, in that module or that big idea. And so um, I kind of think that of all of them, um, the teaching goal setting and teaching budgeting and, and consumer um, decision making is probably in some ways the easiest for teachers. And so when I was thinking about what I thought might be useful to share with you, um, I, I thought of some conversations that I've had with a number of teachers and educators recently on how um, really things are changing in terms of how we teach not just personal finance, but everything um, to what is what is being referred to in some cases as the digital natives, this Generation Z. Um, they're the ones that are coming in after the millennials. Um, and so um, we uh, we have lots of, of sort of questions um, about how we how we teach this this new generation. So. This is a multitasking generation. Now, keep in mind, this generation is basically um, the um, uh, the age range of um, uh, basically 19 and under right now. Um, so, pretty much everybody that's in a um, in a school or a high school right now um, and younger would be considered part of um, this generation. And, oh, sorry, um, not only that, but they are, um, you know, as we said, a, a, the digital natives. These are kids who have grown up in the area, in the era of, um, of the internet. The, the internet's pretty much been around since these kids were born. Um, it's not a, if they should use um, technology, it's how they're using technology. So consider some of these questions. You know, how will this generation keep financial records? How will they maintain a budget? How will they make consumer decisions? So think of that in terms of the, the connection between money management and, and these, um, these young kids nowadays. And I'm guessing that if you think about that and you think about maybe how you first started doing these things or perhaps are doing these things, that the answers are probably going to be quite different. Um, you know, uh, you know, m many of us are still getting used to the the notion that, you know, my, my cell phone is my camera um, and vice versa. You know, kids nowadays, uh, you know, they don't ask for a camera anymore. They ask for a, a cell phone that has it built in. Um, you know, they're not going to, they're, they're in almost no cases I would be willing to bet going to be keeping a hard copy pen and paper, um, you know, and, and or even probably spreadsheet version of a budget. Um, they're very likely to be doing these things on their phones um, or whatever technology continues to, to come down the, the, 
the the Pike, um, you know, the 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 Apple Watch, for example, um, and its ability to make payments, you know, from your wrist. Who'd have thought of these things, you know, a number of years ago? But I think that we need to start thinking and and being aware of how um, changes to technology are greatly going to impact um, and already are impacting how young people today are interacting um, with everything, but personal finance um, and money management certainly um, key amongst those. So here's um, some some facts and figures for you. So um, you know the millennials, as it says, were those that were born between 1976 and 90, 1994, um, have certainly been you know in the news a lot. Um, but the next generation of consumers um, is Generation Z. And they have a, a lot to, to get to know about them. Um, this generation is is currently our largest generation already, um, with well over with over a quarter of the the population um, considered to be to be of this generation. Um, As I mentioned before, they're digital natives. You know, Generation Z would rather watch or listen to streaming media media on demand than traditional TV. And I think that's a fascinating differentiator. You know, for those of us um, you know that are of an age to be teaching um, and or an age to have been teaching for quite some time, um, you know, this I think is a is an interesting point um, to be taken. Um, you know, and, and just points out to just how digital. Um, you know, these kids are um, nowadays. Generation Z, are their finders and sharers. Um, I loved this phrase that they love to curate. Um, you know, they they love things like Pinterest and Polyvore. If you're not familiar with either of those, I'd encourage you um, to, to get online and check both of them out. Polyvore is um, something I'm sure most of your high school um, girls in particular are familiar with. It's a great way to put together style boards and all that sort of stuff. Um, how girls plan for what they're going to wear to homecoming or prom. Um, but I think there's an interesting tie to these. You know, a lot of this has to do with aspirations and goal setting. You know, um, I know teachers that are having their students use um, Pinterest to create boards that tie to some of their short, medium, or long-term goals or different types of goals. What are your goals for um, your career? What are your goals for um, for other different types of things that, that you want to um um, to do later in life, um, you know, maybe where it is that you want to live, what kind of car you want to drive, visualize those things um, and, and curate them somewhere. Online, it doesn't have to be Pinterest. You can even do it just by setting up a simple blog or other types of things. But that's um, a, a, a functionality that, um, that makes a, a strong connection to this generation. Um, they rarely use email. It's simply too slow. And I think that um, is an interesting connection to sort of where they are in terms of um, what they're going to use and and or not use and, and their um, uh, their attention span. Um, you know, they say that the attention span of this generation is the shortest that it's ever been. And so we need to be thinking about that. And, you know, when when we think about, you know, if it's too slow, you know, short term goals are very short term goals for this um, for this age range. Um, mid and long term, getting them to think longer range can sometimes be challenging. This is another interesting piece. If you think about it, um, these are kids who have grown up in a time of uncertainty. Um, you know, post 9-11 world, the economic recessions, um, changing norms. Um, this generation, though, is very mature. You think about the, the the media of this generation. You know, you're talking about things like um, the Divergent series and um, and the Hunger Games. You know, these are the these are the novels and movies that this um, generation um, is growing up with that are very mature con concepts. Um, and so, you know, you, it's sort of interesting to think about um, the the uh, it's also a, a set of very adept researchers. researchers. Um, these are kids that, that love to use um, uh, YouTube or social media for research assignments. When it comes specifically to money, um, we do have some t statistics to share. Um, 
the we are finding that more um, young people are interested in saving their money um, and it's continuing to grow. So 57% um, of the kids that were surveyed in this survey of teens um, in 2014 said that saving money was important versus 50% in 2013. Um, if handed $500, 9 out of 10 said that they'd save at least some of it. 37% um, reported that having a budget to follow is important um, and that they do that. But on the downside, just 17% believe investing is the way to prepare for retirement. 47% believe savings accounts um, are best. And that, I think, is totally tying back to what this generation has experienced. You know, you're talking about kids who've seen the, the, uh, the, um, uh, you know, the, the Great Recession, if you will. These are also kids that are um, driven to work and they have a very strong entrepreneurial um, spirit um, in these students. 76% wish their hobbies would turn into full-time jobs. That's compared to 50% of millennials. So a big shift, I think, there um, in what we're seeing. 80% um, of high school students believe they are more driven than their peers. 72% of high school students want to start their own business someday. They have a lot of, of goals and a lot of worries when it comes to higher education, though. Um, one of the key ones, well, will they have a job when they graduate? Um, a lot of uh, these young people nowadays are thinking of their bachelor's degree as almost like high school nowadays. Um, and a lot of them will need to attend um, college beyond, uh, beyond a traditional um, bachelor's degree um, with 53% planning on advanced degrees. And of course, with that comes um, you know, significant uh, increased levels of, of student debt. 65% plan to pay tuition with help from scholarships or grants. Um, and that, I think, is where we see a disconnect um, in that that's not an incredibly realistic number, considering usually only 50% of students get scholarships or grants. Um, certainly that doesn't include lo um, loans, but um, a lot of kids thinking that they'll be able to do this without um, incurring costs on their own. Um, just some other, a few other statistics. Um, one in four American children are living in poverty right now. 73% of children have been personally affected by the Great Recession. And many are living in multi-generational homes. So in a lot of cases, retired grandparents um, coming to move in and or boomerang siblings, siblings that went to college or went off on, on their own, having struggle, uh, having a hard time um, and or haven't found jobs and are, are back at home. Um, the lesson for this for, for Generation Z is that a lot of times traditional choices don't guarantee success. So all of these, again, I think are things that we need to just keep in mind as we try and um, instruct these students that, you know, their mindset is different. Uh, their take on finances is, a, is very mature and very realistic. Um, this is not considered an optimistic generation. That's a very realistic generation which to me shows that, that there could be some, a lot of upsides to that in terms of students that are interested and willing to, um, to learn about money. Um, but we need to make sure that they also understand that you know, things like investing and, and other things over the long term really are their best bet. So a lot of, a lot of opportunities here, I think. Um, if you have any questions, I will be reading those over on the sidebar. Um, I've also included a slide with some sources for some of these, um, these statistics and, and other things. If you want to go back to these, again, this will be in the, um, in the material that I uh, upload for everyone tomorrow or later tonight. And so with that, I'm going to um, conclude this section of the agenda, and I'd like to um, welcome aboard our next presenters. We are um, joined this afternoon by um, Will and Mike with Full Proof. Will and Mike, are you there? Most certainly. Yes, we are. All right, very good. Um, I'll just remind folks um, that because we're switching off to a different set of presenters, their volume may be different than mine. Um, so if you need to adjust your volume and turn that up, um, certainly do. Um, they're going to be uh, sharing a microphone, so I'm sure they'll get as close as they can and, or project as much as necessary. If you're having any problems hearing, um, do just let us know over in the questions area. And with that, I'll turn things over now to, to Will and to Mike. Thank you very much, Hilary. Very kind of you. Um, hi, everyone. Um, we will quickly get started and share our screens. 
I hope everybody can see this okay. Um, this is the beginning of our presentation about our uh, program called Foolproof, which has got everything to do with financial education, um, financial literacy in your classroom. Before we get started, we'll, uh, we'll quickly introduce ourselves and tell you a little bit about our, um, our little company. I'm, uh, I'm Will. I'm originally from Holland. Um, pretty much lived there all my life and came to the United States after college, after graduating college, traveling around, trying to have some fun, meeting young Americans, and saw the big difference between American young people and uh, people over in Europe, and mainly Holland. Um, how Holland is much of a, a savings culture. You save money before you buy anything. Um, your car, we don't get credit cards. Um, it's, it's very much a, a savings culture rather than the debt culture that uh, I think we have here in the United States. Um, coming to America uh, probably about 10 years ago, um, meeting a lot of young people in trouble with money, I was like, well, why does this happen? And um, I was working as an intern for this consumer advocate at the time, and him and I decided to start a company to help young people manage money. Um, and not just have your average um, like uh, educational program where you balance your checkbook and learn how to write checks and things, but also make it meaningful for uh, for young people. And have it all be about smart consumerism, uh, being that smart, savvy consumer, and really knowing how to slow down, making the right decisions with whatever transaction you're doing with your money, whatever purchase you're doing. We'll get to that a little bit more in um, in a second. Before we get too much in it, I'd like to introduce to you Mike Sheffer, our Director of Education. Hi, I'm Mike, and uh, I am a classroom teacher in Corning, Paint and Post High School. I've been involved in uh, education for 30 years. Um, I actually met Will about 10 years ago when the process first started with Foolproof, and uh, we started to collaborate on the problem with financial literacy at the time and how it was presented and the idea of how we were not probably engaging our students in the best way. Um, one of the things that we came up with early in the process was uh, even though we all think we're very interesting as teachers and all of our lessons are very important, they kind of you know zone us out a little bit so I noticed when Will came into my classroom in his first presentation on scams that affect young people, there was great attention uh, focused on Will because he was a young person. And also he was very interesting and dynamic in the classroom. So as we started to develop Foolproof, we wanted a strong, tough-as-nails curriculum, but we also wanted to make sure that it was interesting. So we came up with a concept of talking to the students, not talking at them. We as teachers talk at our students. They're talked at by their parents. Um, so as, you, well, we, as we go through the Foolproof program, you'll start to see that a lot of our videos, I'm sorry, not a lot of them, all of them are uh, youth-based videos. Um, we can, we're very, uh, we were very um, adamant about keeping the concept of talking to the students. So I started with working with Will and the Foolproof team. We've been together a long time now. Um, we use Foolproof in our school in New York State. Um, actually, every school in the field of membership of our local credit union uses Foolproof. And it's kind of nice this week that actually Will is in town. Uh, because he's going around presenting to the classes, you know, he, he's the president and CEO and he's in a ton of the videos also. So it's, it's one of those things that the kids really get excited for. And we were actually out to dinner last night and the night before and he's, you know, hey, those are the foolproof guys. So it's kind of a, a concept that we've had really good luck here with in, in our uh, part of the state. So we, um, we've grown foolproof over the last couple of years and we, uh, we basically come from this slightly different than, uh, than average um, company. What we, what we focus on is we really want to, uh, to have financial literacy and smart consumer, um, consumerism available to any teacher, any high school, any educator, anywhere in the country for free, um, always. Uh, so we really try to, uh, to make this one, um, like accessible for young people, but also um, good for, for schools and, and, and free for schools to, uh, to implement. And at the same time, 
put in some really smart teacher tools at the, um, at the back end to actually for, for a teacher to control the, the classroom environment in the, the most optimized way and, and uh, Mike will actually show you a little bit about that in uh, or a little bit lots about that in, uh, in a minute um, as we said like the program can be provided to your school for no cost no bait and switch no catch or whatsoever uh, we provide these programs for free through our uh, our foundation um, and we um, we try to raise money for our foundation outside of um, of, of anything that has to do with uh, with charging schools for it. And uh, none of the people that uh, donate to our foundation have any say in our messaging or whatsoever. It is tough as nails, financial education um, that you probably don't find anywhere else. Um, and as what Mike said, it's a program that quickly engages the students because of the peer-to-peer -peer teaching. And then it's a unique type of web-driven financial literacy instruction. Where we um, we really teach smart consumerism, as you'll uh, you'll see in uh, in a minute. Uh, now we're true consumer advocates. We uh, we came from this from a uh, consumer advocacy background. We work together with a couple of uh, consumer groups, as you'll see in a minute, to actually put together the uh, the curriculum and make sure that this is the information that young people uh, need to hear when it comes to money management and being that uh, that smart consumer. And um, even though we have uh, in certain areas we have uh, credit union sponsorships, like here in uh, in Corning, New York, where we are right now, um, but it doesn't mean that uh, the credit union or anyone has anything to say over what we put in our modules. Um, all our advice is uh, is not based on, on selling anything, but purely educating uh, educating young people. Because of that consumer stance, we've uh, we've had some um, some great interesting uh, partnerships. Uh, first of all, with the Consumer Federation of America, as well as the National Association of Consumer Advocates, organizations who do not approve of uh, of banks and for-profit businesses, but do sponsor the foolproof program. And we're actually uh, through our foundation going around the country together with uh, with both these organizations to provide this financial literacy. Um, to, uh, to well any consumer around the country. Beside our high school program, we've got seven other different programs that teach different uh, parts of, of consumerism in colleges uh, at, the, at the home, um, but also like consumer newspaper websites. Um, so, um, but we're focusing on the high school program now and together with these two organizations, we are focused on bringing financial literacy to as many schools around the country as we, uh, as we can basically to teach young people the importance of managing their money and showing showing them what's really happening out there when they're um, well like uh, starting participating in their uh, their life with uh, with money and uh, credit um, we're also a partner with uh, with jumpstart uh, lots of state departments of education around uh, around the country um, so I think we uh, we're quite uh, a recognizable um, organization when it comes to providing this financial literacy Enough about who we are. Let's talk about the, the program and see how it could actually um, uh, interest you as a, a teacher. What Foolproof for High Schools really is, it's a, a turnkey financial education program that um, as a teacher you can implement in your classroom. Uh, as you'll see in a minute, uh, the curriculum that we have can be completely customized to your own curriculum. Whether you use our whole program or just use elements of it, it can easily be implemented with a couple of tools that we integrated into our, uh, our backend. And we really try to, um, to teach those, uh, those critical thinking skills that young people need to have when it comes to, uh, to managing their money and really try to help them make those smart, smart money decisions a habit rather than uh, something they just do when they're working through the, through the program. So we don't only teach those road skills like balancing a checkbook or knowing how to, uh, um, to like write checks and things, but really slow young people down when it comes to making any decisions when it comes to their, uh, their money and make them, uh, make them those smart consumers. A uh, quick overview before we give you some more details later, but um, as we mentioned already, everything is web-driven and online and interactive. That's, um, I think, also what... Um, and what Hillary said in her presentation, how young people like to access and might like to learn these days. Uh, most of it is on the web, and um, uh, so is the, the foolproof program. It's the peer-to-peer -peer teaching. It's tough as nails, and it meets or exceeds most of the personal finance standards throughout the, throughout the country. And uh, we're working, obviously, together with Hillary to, um, um, to actually tie foolproof in with uh, the Pennsylvania standards also. And uh, we're in the process of doing this, and um, I think by the time we're done, We'll be able to say that we meet, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, Mike, but uh, meet all of the, the Pennsylvania um, personal finance standards. 
Um, quick overview of foolproof. What what we really have in the back end um, is, um, I guess if you put it all together, there's about 20 to 45 minute financial literacy instructions at the moment. Um, you can obviously add this uh, or add to this as much as you want. Um, but if you just do our online modules, it'll probably take about uh, about 20 to 45 minute sessions to complete. Additionally, we're working on including about 20 assignments and 15 group activities. Um, I guess they are aligned to the um, uh, to the, the common core standards that are out there for financial literacy. Uh, I don't know exactly how long they would take to complete, but you can you can look at the assignments, and I'll pass it to Mike, as he says now, to uh, to give you a little more background on that. So what we uh, have been working on are, are two things actually. We did. Um, design with the team, with our consumer advocate team and our uh, web designers and everybody that's involved in Foolproof. We designed t roughly 20 assignments and 15 group activities that are piggybacked on the concept of the modules. What have we been finding is Foolproof has been very popular around the United States and what's happening is one class will use Foolproof, it even happens in my school, that they'll take a business class and some of the, the modules were used in there and then they come over to their personal finance class where we use foolproof as our curriculum and then you had this overlap of even maybe it happened during a semester. So that's one of the reasons why we designed it. On The other reason is that we kind of went in the idea that with the common core you started to get more than the multiple choice true false test and a lot of teachers are looking for a little bit more evaluation because just here in New York State we have the standard of learning um, the slows that are being used to evaluate teachers so what we decided to do was we were going to get ahead of it a little bit and even though that financial literacy is not considered in the common core it is considered in the math and the, uh, English language arts so what we did, and actually we were kind of pushed by the state of Tennessee, which actually was a good thing for us because the state of Tennessee has adopted financial literacy graduation requirements with the new standards that include the Common Core. So we worked with the state of Tennessee and we provide a financial literacy education curriculum for the state. And what we've done is that we've actually started working on those evaluations. So as we talk to, uh, to Pennsylvania and we talk to Hillary, we're actually going to post those for Pennsylvania also. So those activities are actually available for the state and I'm going to align those to your new curriculum also. So we're real happy that we could get involved with Tennessee and do that, but we also saw a need all over the country for that. So that's what the 20 assignments and 15 group activities include and they'll, they are coming soon. Uh, we're trying to get a date down where they're going to be available on Foolproof Teacher. So in uh, addition to that, uh, on the back end of the program, we've got some great management uh, or classroom management tools such as uh, like locking modules and tests, um, tests at the end of every, every module, a curriculum creator that will let you uh, assign specific modules to specific uh, classes or specific students, um, lots of ways to actually um, actually customize uh, the, the foolproof program to your uh, to your classroom and um, we think the program is quite turnkey and, uh, and labor saving for uh, for teachers for young people we, we mentioned it a couple of times already for the students working through this um, it's all about young people like how, how do uh, young people make mistakes with money and how, how do you get out of that when you're in it and um, every story in foolproof is true we've got some really scary scam stories but also little mistakes with, um, with, with bouncing checks and such that um, really can, uh, can grow into a big problem for a young person. Everything's online um, and everything is, is interactive and, uh, and fun. We try to make this um, really interesting for the, the young people and trying to keep their attention with like throwing in videos with specific learning topics, um, adding music, um, game, uh, games and gamifications. Um, as well as like those hard-hitting facts and we think uh, we've done quite an all right job at uh, teaching the importance of uh, the financial literacy to young people but also making that, uh, that fun and interesting. We've got lots of videos throughout, uh, throughout the program. I think there's a total of 225 videos to our, uh, our 18 different models that we, that we have on the back end and uh, we'd love to 
show you a, a quick video. Um, this video, this particular video, is about um, what happens if you don't shop around, for instance, for something like uh, like a pair of jeans, and if you automatically believe marketing and advertising. Are you tired of not paying enough for your jeans? How much do you normally spend on your jeans? Thirty, fifty, seventy-five dollars? Well, then you're gonna love our denim. It's made from the exact same material, looks identical, and is sometimes even made at the same factory as our inexpensive competitors. About the only difference between those bargain chains and our absurdly overpriced apparel is the label. That's right, folks. You can pay three, four, or five times as much for about the same jeans with a different label. Why shop around for the most expensive jeans when you can just buy ours right now for as much as you're willing to spend? Don't wait for the half-price sale in a week because that's ridiculous. Act right now and pay as much as possible for these totally unspecial pants. Call today. We'll add special taxes and shipping and handling to the first 100 orders. Call today. Operators are standing by. That's just one of the uh, many videos that uh, that are in the in the program, and uh, we uh, we talk about lots of different things: credit reports, where to get them, how to read them, um, where to get them for free, obviously, and I show them like, hey, if you automatically believe marketing and advertising, you click on that, um, the, you listen to that fancy uh, creditreport.com uh, jingle that you hear on TV, and uh, before you know it, you're stuck with a $25 monthly bill that you can't get rid of, and uh, you know all the, the stuff that happens with that. So. Um, lots of hard-hitting facts that, that young people really can uh, can use. Um, sample message about uh, about some of the modules. For instance, uh, module two, breathing without air, the importance of credit. We say, like, hey, basically, if you believe you can go through life ignoring reality, you're going to make a lot of people laugh, especially when it comes to the way you handle your money and a simple thing called credit. And then we explain credit and, um, and how it impacts their life in, in many different ways, but then also how to build credit after they heard it uh, at, a, at a young age. Uh, or how it can impact their life as you uh, as you go out and uh, and about in the in the big bad world as we uh, as we say, got tons of hard hitting credit uh, message about uh, about credit cards too, uh, what to do, what not to do with credit cards, how it can be great to have that financial buffer, but also how it can be the the easiest way to uh, to mess up your credit real soon when you're uh, when you're going off to college or um, or of course at any any time really and um, really try to give them that message that they need like make sure that. Uh, uh, that you don't carry balances and, and such like that. Uh, really make sure that they understand all the details about credit cards before they even uh, get close to uh, to getting one. Um, another fun little example about uh, some of the messages that we have when it comes to checking accounts and um, and what happens with uh, why you should have a checking account as a, as a young person and what happens if you don't have a checking account, you go to one of those check casting services. Um, I think this is quite a, quite a fun little video to quickly show you. Hey, wait a minute. Why do I have to worry about scammers and checking accounts at all? Can't I forget checking accounts, period, and buy money orders to pay for everything? You could. But money orders are a ripoff compared to the cost of paying by check, and they take time to get. Plus, money orders don't build credit. Then can't I just cash my check at one of those check cashing offices? You shouldn't cash a check at a check cashing office. Most of the services are ripoffs. That place is a ripoff. Look it away. Do, do, do. Check cashing services charge up to 20% to cash a personal check. That means if you cash a $500 check, you have to pay 100 bucks. Lame. How many hours do you work to take home 100 bucks? <laughs> it costs practically nothing to put your paycheck in a checking account, and your money is safe. Your money can earn interest, plus you're building credit. So fun little uh, little tips and uh, and tricks on uh, on checking accounts and um, basically grabs the uh, the attention of of young people a lot better than just telling them what to uh, to do with their money. We uh, we think so. We've had foolproof in, um, in in thousands of high schools around the country. And um, <clears throat> excuse me, at the end of the program, we always say like, okay, thanks um, for uh, participating, obviously. But uh, we've tested a lot of you on, uh, or we tested you on a lot of different subjects. It's now time for you to grade us. What did you think of this? And uh, we've got a continual survey that we think we get quite uh, quite good results on. About 80% continuously says that uh, they find foolproof easy to understand. Um, about the same amount say that foolproof would help friends or themselves in uh, in school, and um, I think that uh, that third bullet is quite significant. About uh, about two thirds of young people that work through foolproof say that they are through foolproof in school say they wouldn't mind working through another foolproof session in their own time, and uh, we think that's quite significant. Because how many young people do you know that actually volunteer for uh, for school work? So. 
Um, we think we're doing uh, quite all right when it comes to our um, our messaging and the way we uh, we teach to the to the students. Um, we are always changing our uh, our messages out, the videos out. If we uh, if regulation changes, and, uh, we can literally in a, in a couple of hours change out things on the on the back end of our program. If we hear from students or teachers that something is stupid or boring or doesn't work. Um, uh, we've got a, a technical team that is around to uh, to change things uh, around, as well as troubleshoot anything that can go wrong um, on the um, on the the teacher back end or students losing their passwords and such. And uh, um, basically a a fun little program. But let's show you what's uh, what's in the in the back end and what um, what's all uh, behind Foolproof. So uh, Mike, take it away. So when we decided to decided what modules we were going to use for foolproof technically there was from a state standard point of view there wasn't that many out there at the time uh, we did go off to jumpstart standards we do align to all the national standards so again going with the whole concept that we want to talk to students not at students we decided that we were going to get right into the financial part of you know the, the money side of uh, debit cards credit cards uh, everything else that goes with money management but we wanted to make sure that our our module names were fun and you know kind of interesting so you know we that's how we came up with the idea when it hits the fan you know something usually goes wrong you know breathing without air the importance of credit you can't live without air you can't live without credit kick some buck is kind of taking charge of your credit and avoiding scams road trip and I, and I always use this example when I'm actually on a road trip giving teacher presentations that you remember when you've got your license for the first time and it was that feeling of you get to listen to the radio station you want to you don't have anyone telling you what to do you have that freedom you know and really checking accounts debit cards and in your banking process gives you that first real freedom in, on how you're going to handle your money and your money management skills sucker punch of course when it goes bad with credit cards burning money is one I, I use burning money in every business class that we teach and even if the class doesn't use all foolproof burning money was I think one of the hardest modules we wrote because we had so many ideas about how we want to do budgeting and we want to do it in a fun way so we did a lot of interactive work in burning money we have an interactive spending journal that the students fill out and it's all directed for the teacher when to do it prior to the module one week before you want your students to do your interactive budget or, or their interactive spending journal and then they enter it into our budgetary software the one thing that I've seen after using foolproof in the classroom for such a long period of time is the budgeting and saving part of it um, they're spending a lot of money on things that they probably don't have to spend it on a lot of of course if they're driving is gas but then a lot of it is the idea of you know convenience food, vending machines, gas station, you know, Gatorades and coffees and all those different things. You know, and I tell them, I said, you know, a lot of you could tell your parents that you like this type of crackers. They could go to the one of the big stores, Sam's Clubs, Costco's, BJ's, and they'd buy you a whole case of them for about 22 cents a piece. You'd save yourself a lot of money. So it's just one of those things that we tried to make an interactive and, and interesting form. Once we got through the beginning modules of foolproof, we started looking at some needs and we started looking at, you know, some of the things that our, our students needed to know more of. And this is where we came with our supplemental modules. All of our modules are video driven. They are, uh, they're either read and, and recite type modules and they're video driven and there's game breaks and there's interactive questions to move on. And if they don't do the question right, we direct them back to, and give them hints on how to answer the question. There's also a drop down calculator form and a drop down note taking guide. So the note taking guide is something that we came up with with they'll take notes as they go through the modules. But here I am the teacher guy and you know we talked about the note-taking concept but so the first time we put the note-taking concept in teachers were so excited about it or whatever but we forgot to take it off when it came to testing so the first time that I went in and I used it in the note-taking guide I saw a student <laughs> with their notes and their notes were open and I go where'd you get that he goes they're still here 
So we had to go back and talk to our development team and say, okay, the, the note taking thing is a great hit, but we need to take it off for testing. Oh yeah, that makes sense. So we're always working on the software to make sure it fits our teachers needs. And uh, I'm the one that, you know, talks to a ton of teachers on this and we're always going through the process. So these are our 18 modules that are there. Um, they're all explained well. And I'm going to take you out on Foolproof Teacher in a minute here to kind of show you where the teacher can actually look at all the curriculum that goes in each module. They can preview it. We have demo codes for you. And again, there is, as Will said, there is nothing about Foolproof that will cost you anything. We, we do not advertise on any of our, our sites. We don't advertise on any of our pages. Um, this is, you know, one of the things as a teacher I always was nervous about is well, who's trying to sell me something. And, you know, and, and kind of my influence on this too and our consumer advocate influence on this was that, you know, this is going to be information. We're going to make this as easy as we can for the teacher, but, you know, a hard consumer message for the students. So some of the things that we do for the teacher is, you know, again, being a 30-year veteran, you know, we all love grading tests, don't we? So the idea is that we're gonna, we went self-graded with your test. There is a pre and post test and uh, I have a, um, a page on Foolproof Teacher that explains how to use the pre and post test and then I'll let you go into that yourself because we're going to be a little short on time. But the pre and post test works great for here in New York State and I know you're going to it in Pennsylvania about you having your standard of learning objectives. We have a lot of teachers using the pre and post test to show the competency of their teaching by using the foolproof modules in their curriculum. And we have seen an increase, of course, in the scores from the pre and the post test. So I wrote, just gave you instructions on foolproof teacher, how to administer it, and how to go about showing that as your standard of learning. It tracks your student progress, which I'll show you in a minute. What we started to see too is when we first put out the test, some students would get to the test early, some students would look at the other person's screen, you know, all those things that we have to think about as, as educators. So what we did was we gave the teacher the ability to, to set the date of the test at when it's going to be released. And that has been a huge uh, bonus for our teachers so they can say, okay, you're going to start module three on Wednesday, but the test is not going to be released till Friday. So you have to take your time and go through the model. And you can track your progress through it too. And again, I give you all that on Foolproof Teacher. We also went to randomized testing. What would happen is teachers would come and tell us that Billy was looking at Johnny's screen and they got to the test at the same time. So we wrote more test questions and we randomized them. So for instance, they may get test A, Billy may get test B. And then test B and test A could be different questions or in different order and everything else is there to kind of combat that a little bit. Of course, and then you can customize your curriculum as you go. Of course, there's a way that we do when you, if you have a graduation requirement, which some states do where you check off the MET standards, we, uh, we created a passport for Oklahoma for that. And then of course, you can reset the test function, easy student sign up, forget password function. And I was actually just working on something, and, and I'll do the same for Pennsylvania, is I'm a big believer in my class. You have to get 80% or greater on your test scores. If you don't, I actually print their test, you know, and, and the whole class is using foolproof. And you're, I'm going to be honest, you're not very busy when they're on foolproof. It, you, if you do it as turnkey, it's kind of eerie how quiet it is in there. They all have their headphones on. They're going through their work. You're going around the room to make sure. We have the visions program in our school where I can lock them down that they only can be on the foolproof which helps a lot. So the idea is that you have time to review a test with your students. I print it out and I go through them with them and I talk to them and then I reset the test and I'll put a date on it and they can take it. I'm a big believer that you know this is their financial future and their understanding of money. I'm not quite sure you know and I the way I explain it to my students is do you want 60 cents on a dollar? Do you want 70 cents on a dollar? I mean, I understand we got to move forward, so I'd go with 80 cents on a dollar. But the idea is that I think everybody wants 100 cents on a dollar, and that's how I look at it when we go through their testing. So here's an example of the back end. This is a foolproof teacher account. You will get your own account. You'll have your own, you know, sign in and password, and I'll show you how to do that in a little bit. But the idea is it just kind of gives you on your foolproof page 
it is customized to you, your components, your classes, and all those different things. What will happen is you'll get all the updates on the foolproof teacher account. I'm going to go through this a little quick so we can go take you live. Here's an example of your class when it was started. And to be honest, one of the things that we talked about at the beginning of Foolproof, because I've been on some other programs in the past where it took you 40 minutes to create your class list, type all your kids' names in, put in their passwords and everything else. They, once you register your class, they get, you get a class code. And then as you go through registering your class, it is extremely easy for you to do. And the only thing you have to give your students is the class code. They fill out everything themselves, and then they go ahead and hit submit. It'll say, is you know, for instance, for my class, is Mike Sheffer your teacher, or Mr. Sheffer's your teacher? You click on yes, and automatically they're entered into that class. Very simple. You can register a class of 35 in, in less than five minutes. This is an example of tracking their progress. The green means they're done with the module. The percentage means that they have... 96% um, for Judy up here on the top completed. I'm not sure why Judy's in module three, but she jumped ahead. Maybe she didn't finish the test. And of course, the red means that she has not started yet. And I've had some great stories about tracking my kids off of the class. So for instance, you're homesick and you got your sub doing foolproof and you go on your computer, you can track your class while they're on it. And all of a sudden, Billy Smith's not doing anything. You check the attendance, and Billy Smith was there all day. Billy Smith's got an answer to you because he didn't do what he was supposed to be doing. As you look, here is the example of the test. All the tests are graded for you, and they're all done by a percentage basis. Each module has a test. There, there are 18 modules. Two are practice modules or guided practice. So there will be 16 tests. Every test has a different number of questions. depends on the length of the module. How I use this in my classroom is each foolproof module counts as a quiz score, and at the end, there's a foolproof final. What, and all it is is what did you receive total all the way across for your foolproof grades. So I'm, I'm having 16 quizzes when I'm doing foolproof. We have not used the new stuff yet, and there's a whole bunch of new evaluations coming. And then at the end, that's their foolproof grade. And I, of course, if you don't do the test or whatever, then you have classroom management. You can take care of that any way you want. But it gives you a real good option to be able to use. And again, it's all self-graded. This is just this is a screenshot of where it's available. So, for instance, you can make your tests available or unavailable. You set the time, the date, and then, of course, if it's going to be released or not. That actually has helped us control it. The red says that the test is not available. The dark green says the test is available. So, of course, you can set the date as you go through it. And it's really helped with the management of the program. You can actually, rather than only uh, blocking the test access, you can now also block the module access. So if you don't want anyone to go further than module one, you can block all the other modules. Uh, when the whole class is done, you can release module two, three, and so on. And that, that's one of the things that, that we receive that from teachers. Um, I kind of controlled that in my classroom. Um, and then when we started to receive that more and more from teachers, we thought that was a really great idea. Um, this just kind of gets you to create the new curriculum. And, Will, you can talk on that mm -hmm. quick. What, uh, what happens in the curriculum creator is uh, for each class that you have in your, uh, your back end, you can, in this curriculum creator, select the modules you want them to work through. And uh, Mike will show you in a minute um, uh, where you can find what each module is, uh, is about. Um, but here in the back end, you can then select like module one, uh, introduction to money and credit, module two, breathing without air about credit, um, module four, road trip, you select a few modules, click submit at the end and then assign it to a specific class and your class will get the modules. To, uh, you will only see the modules that you picked for them. So very, uh, very easy. So uh, we're going to take you out live now to Foolproof Teacher just because so, I know we're done here in a little bit and we're, if there's questions or anything else. So here's a live page for Foolproof Teacher. And what this is, this is a, this is a teacher-directed page that everything you need to know about how to implement Foolproof in your curriculum is here. I mean, I, one of my biggest suggestions for you is spend some time on this site. 
Okay, you can go through and review the curriculum. You can see what other people are saying about it. But the, the process is, for instance, when you go to the curriculum, what happens is that, you know, there's sample videos for you there too, but it gives you the breakdown of the curriculum. And, and these are the bullet points of what the curriculum teaches. So when you're looking at, like, if I'm aligning this curriculum to your state standards, these are the kind of the bullets that I use as it goes through. So every every one of these, you know, all the names that I gave you before, they're all gone through and they've, they've used this, we've used this curriculum guide for it. So that's just something I want you to look at. The other part too is, as you go through it and, and you look at the process, one of the things that we think that's really important for you is to go through the program. Now you can go through it as a demo account okay or you can go through and just sign up foolproof is free you know and I encourage you to sign up and maybe if you're you're not quite sure about it yet or you know you have a couple students that you want to use and just you know have them go through the program and you know the students will be extremely honest with you okay it's just a great way for you to go through the program and see it so it's extremely easy to sign up all you do is go to the register page and you go through and you put your school or, or the business or, you know, if it's a Boys and Girls Club, it doesn't matter to us, you know. And as you go through it, you just go ahead and use your email address. We tell you why. Sometimes we want your personal email address. We'll never share it, but sometimes it gets blocked as you go through, okay. And then as you go through and the subjects you teach and what are you, what are you looking for, you know, the preferred program, of course, we're talking about foolproof for high schools. Um, since we are a little bit, we are using credit unions as part of our, our process of funding. We always ask for the affiliated credit union. It is optional. And what will happen inside of 24 hours when you send this in, you will get a teacher code. And the teacher code then, you go through and you just follow the prompt, and now you'll be registered on foolproof. Once you do that, you can create a section for yourself to go through it, or you can go through the demo version that's on foolproof teacher. There's also too if you have if you need help getting started on foolproof everything is here for you for the idea of how to go ahead and start the program we've done screenshots for you how to log in you know your access code everything is 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 really uh, panned out nice for as you go through it so the idea is that you know with foolproof teacher everything is there that you need I mean and my big suggestion to all teachers is you go out on the site take some time go through it go through it page by page take a look at what you know what foolproof has to offer for you but I will tell you from the teacher point of view number one it's very easy to use okay number two we do a, a lot of the work for teachers through the back end the registration of students the curriculum and of course the process of you know the grading and the evaluations but the nicest thing about foolproof is number one we always update it by that I mean anything that changes you know for in then financial literacy or anything to that effect you know we go through that process of making the change the other thing that we like to do too is we listen to teachers we have a great uh, customer service pro, you know support team that if you go ahead and email us a question we try to turn that question over in 24 or 48 hours for you to help you implement it into your classroom I really like the program we use it in our schools um, it is free and, and you know I know that's sometimes hard to believe there is no as Will said earlier bait and switch there's nothing that you're ever going to get charged for um, we are a foundation and in uh, the process that we go through is that you know we want to make this free for teachers all over the world and uh, Foolproof will, will never charge schools for using foolproof. So I know we ran through it kind of quick. I know you've been on here for a while. If there's any questions uh, for Will and I, we'd like to take them. So we we just got a question. I don't know, Hillary, how you want to do this. Do we read the question or does everyone see them? Sure. I saw two questions. Uh, the first one was, uh, I, I think you've answered, um, but sort of why do you invest so much in foolproof if you're not getting paid and how can this be free? I think you've uh, talked about that. Um, we had a, another question about any colleges that are using or testing foolproof. Well, it's funny. We, we've had to have a lot of schools that are using foolproof solo. 
uh, in, in the uh, it's called that first year experience. Um, I'm actually a college professor, and I use foolproof solo in my introduction to business classes, my economic classes, and I use it for extra credit. Foolproof solo is very similar to foolproof high school, except you can set up the back end a little bit differently. Um, I don't. I have to reword it too for a little older yeah. age student. So I've had a great success with foolproof for, uh, or I'm sorry, foolproof solo in my college classes. And uh, and I see that Kathy's asked that question. So <coughs> Kathy, if you want to drop us an email, I can actually send you the list of colleges that are using foolproof solo. And then um, our final question um, also is about how you supplement the program with in-class discussion. And while you're answering that, I'm going to take back over and um, switch it over to my screen while, while you guys are still talking. So the supplement the program with in-class discussions, it's actually, we've had a lot of success. And I, I actually answered four or five questions last week on it, that they're using foolproof as an interactive textbook. They're putting it up on the smart board. They're doing the curriculum up on the smart board instead of doing it turnkey. Uh, they're putting some of their students in their classes, they're putting them in pods. So for instance, it's like four, four students in a group, and when the questions come up during the modules, they play a little game with it. It's almost very similar to a Jeopardy game. They give out points, and then as they go through foolproof uh, you know, the videos, they watch them on the screen, and of course when it comes to testing, um, it kind of came out of a necessity when some teachers didn't have computer rooms to be able to take all their students to. They used it, you know, as an interactive textbook. But some teachers are saying they're using it more and more that way to go ahead and create um, in-class discussions. We also have, uh, for everything of foolproof, we have articles that are written. And the, writ the articles that are written are all on, you know, the back end of foolproof teacher where you can actually... Uh, use some article-based things for discussions with your class. Well, thank you both, Will and Mike. We really appreciate um, you participating today and sharing this information for us. I'm um, hoping that you guys get a lot of folks uh, signing on here from Pennsylvania in the next uh, week or so. Well, thank you. Well, thank you for having us. We appreciate it. All right, and with that, I'm just going to um, finish things out here with just a, a reminder that we have uh, the rest of our series coming up. We have five more uh, webinars this school year, um, working our way through each of the topics in the model curriculum, um, as well as featuring additional uh, uh, curriculum uh, resources, such as foolproof that we heard from today. Um, the, uh, the next one we have coming up, we'll be talking about um, the Understanding Taxes program. We have a representative from the IRS that will be joining joining um, us for that, um, as well as some of these others that are um, listed here as well. And then um, we also uh, just wanted to um, thank everybody for, for joining us. And I'm going to end the recording now and um, continue on with a few other things for the folks that are joining us live.